The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. This topic uh, is born out of the desire to understand and teach about a very difficult security concept. Uh, so, we're going to cover quite a lot of material today. Uh, that's why I asked for two sessions, and I'll kind of surprise you with So, the first session here is going to be devoted almost entirely to understanding the theory behind these root jails, when they're used, how they're used. Uh, we're going to answer these questions, I guess, sets of questions. Um, we're going to go through some concepts. And so we're going to show you a couple of tools you may have used before when you have a to understand what it is you're doing and why we need to use those tools. So there are some things we're not going to have time to cover. Uh, there are some tools that will help you build C-Shoot Jails. Uh, some of you may have used them before. I have tried several and I've found mixed results and some will work great. Some of them just utterly fail. They're like, what on earth are you doing? I found I spent more time trying to figure out what earth this tool is doing than just doing it myself. So we're going to cover the theory, we're going to do this by hand. If you guys have learned hackers, odds are when they first started teaching derivatives, they started off with that limit, that stupid formula. You know, if you spend two weeks studying this formula and the limit model is mean, and then they said, oh, there's an easy way to use derivatives. We just, you know, subtract the extra. Why didn't you tell me that earlier? So uh, we're going we're gonna to skip all those tools. Leave it up for you guys to understand later if you'd like to come back. Another thing we're not going to be able to cover uh, Linux containers is basically, Linux containers is like taking feature jokes and going up there and away. You know, those steps. Uh, there's lots of very good information out there. The theory you will gain from this session will help you understand why Linux containers are helping you. We're going to get there several other areas of the easy There's Linux containers, just a couple of those. Um, all that class of stuff. We're also not going to be talking about full system virtualization. Um, that is covered in other detail in many different places. And uh, we're not going to talk about So now that we've discerned what we're not going to cover, uh, so you guys that are uh, just now drifting in, uh, here's our overview of what we're going to be covering here. We're going to be answering some simple questions that have some complex answers. We go through some concepts and tools. Um, like I was saying earlier, we're going to be focusing this first session is entirely on understanding the theory behind the theory The second session, if you guys want to stick around for that, I've got a VM on here, we're actually going to be building the future theory model. So it may go horribly, I don't know. I practiced it once, um, it went horribly then. We just have some fun. Um, also, if you guys have questions, feel free to raise your hand. Um, we'll try to get the whole picture over here. I just want to make sure you guys understand. Warning before we get started, we're going to be slugging through very difficult concepts and tools in order to understand exactly what's going on and how C should go. So, if you have to know some of the uh, underdeveloped parts of it, some of the more internal stuff. We have a lot of ground to cover. And, likely, some of the things that we learned are damaging to us. Hopefully, the introduction that we get here today, we may have to go back later and do more research and you figure out exactly what's happening. So if it doesn't all stick, that's fine. Uh, this web, uh, this uh, presentation is hosted on our website, so you can go back and review it later when you can't remember what you're talking about there. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to break enough ground that you can do your own additional study and it won't seem like grief to you. Uh, that was one of the big problems when I was first learning how to do this. I was like, the people that understand feature jails, they're way up here and I was right about here. I'm trying, I was trying to bridge that gap. So my goal today is to make it easier for you to bridge that gap. So we'll start with a simple question. What is a CH root jail? And in order to answer this question, we're going to break this phrase, CH root jail, down into its respective parts. 
try to make root. Uh, in Linux, hopefully you guys know this, the entire file system is in one big directory chain. And the root of your directory tree is the place where everything else is managed to. Now, this is in contrast to Windows or something else where you have different drives, you can C drive, D drive, whatever else. Um, so when we're saying ch root, what we're actually talking about is we're going to change what a process sees as the root of the system. So you log into a system, you're browsing around, you expect to see certain directories, usually you'll see a slash bar directory, you'll see a, a slash nc, your home directory, all those things, you expect to see those. When you're changing the root of the process, then odds are you won't see those things anymore. You'll be basically, uh, you're moving up the tree, and that's your new home, and that's all your process will be able to see. And the jail portion of this is that we're going to restrict what is inside the CH root to only what's necessary for a process to do its work. Meaning, I don't need 90,000 libraries in my CH root jail for one small tool. I'm not going to carry 90,000 libraries. I'm not going to carry a whole bunch of extra configuration files. I'm not going to copy the entire contents of my Etsy directory into a CH root jail. There's not much point. There's a lot of extraneous information. And part of the reason why we do this is because we want to restrict what information is visible to this service tool process user. What happened? So putting all those things together, we understand the CH root jail is changing the root of the file system for what one process or user can see, and restricting it to only what's necessary for that one user or process to do its work. So that's what CH root jail is. Now, what do they provide? A secure self-contained environment. So it is a jail. Everything that is required to do your job, and you have to be very narrow in how you define that. So a user logs into a system and he needs to access to work with one website. Let's say you're hosting 10 websites on the system. He only needs access to one. So you can build a jail and give him access to just the one site and just the tools he'll need to work on. If you know this user is not going to be working on a command line, don't give him a command line. If you know he just needs access to files, only give him access to files. And this requires knowing exactly what that user process, whatever it is, jailer, knowing exactly what it is going to need. Um, it provides isolation between different processes. So when you see true something, you are blocking it off what that process sees and anything else in the system. If you have multiple CH root jails, they will not know of the existence of each other. So, so you're building its own little world. Uh, a proper CH root jail provides all required functionality inside the jail. Everything you need, nothing you don't. And that's where some of the study we're going to be doing later comes into play. You have to really know your tools intimately to understand all the things it needs. And sometimes you can get really, really tricky in finding out what it needs. And one of the interesting things about CH root jails, they can be built for almost any reason. Today we're going to build them for some pretty typical canonical uses, but there's some pretty awesome stuff you can do. You can build entire subsystems on your servers or on your services and farm those out, whatever you're thinking of. So some examples of where these would be used, like uh, the build chains for Ubuntu, Debian, most every major distribution, when they want to start building their packages, they want to do so in a clean environment. Now, whatever I have running on my system, I want to build a clean environment to compile this tool, make it into a package. So I'm going to build a chroot and chroot into that environment and use it to build my packages. Therefore, whatever changes I've made to my system, whatever customizations, I, I like a different version of libc, I'm playing around with something, I've got some tools. You want to make sure that the changes you made to your system don't contaminate the packages you're making, so you build this see through Jim. Um, I have a service, I have something that the engineers at work use, this tool, and I have another, this tool is very easy to hack. I want to make sure that I can give engineers what they need to do their job without compromising the system itself. So I can set up a see through jail for this service. Or uh, this actually happened a couple years ago that we had a tool that I don't understand why they made this choice. They wanted Red Hat 5 
for, but they wanted to upgrade you to receive from some custom source. And it was the only way to get this one tool working. And it drove me mad that I had to, either I had to build an entire system for this one tool, or I had to set up a CH3 jail so we could coexist with everything else. So I set up a CH3 jail for this one service, this one tool, so we can have all libraries in here to do its special little whatever, and could happily coexist with everything else on the system. Why are CH3 tools useful? Well, if your system gets compromised from one of the tools you're hosting, you can prevent <coughs> that compromise from drifting into the rest of the system. So, traditionally, think of a website. You're servicing web users and you've got dynamic applications and you've got some uh, forms on your page and someone's figured out how to take control of your website. So, to prevent them from accessing the rest of your system, you can set up your web server to be inside a jail. And then, so let's say they do break into your web server. So what? They've got control of that one service, and that's it. And you're limiting the damage to the other 14 services you have and also have on the server. This is called the principle of least privilege. We're trying to give the web service just what it needs to do its job, nothing more, and prevent it from having access to anything else. This, is, this one principle is a guiding philosophy behind a lot of the ideas behind c Treaty, and it's one of the reasons why you're never satisfied with just getting it working. You've got to keep working until you get as good a system as you can get, and we'll see some examples of that later. If we need to maintain local distinct environments for tools, like I was talking about earlier, I had this one tool that had this weird library requirement, and I needed them to coexist on the same server. You also see this, uh, for example, if you guys have used a virtual environment for Python or RVM, it's the same kind of concept. You're temporarily building a small environment, like a, a virtual environment, you're actually um, you're activating an extra pathing element for your shell, and you're able to work with them just this little set of binaries, this little set of uh, Python packages you've got. It's the same kind of tool, same kind of idea. Here we're building distinct environments for different tools and we're making sure that they are able to stay separate and don't clash with each other. Again, like I was saying, uh, in case uh, software would require a specific library. Um, you can opt to move services onto their own VMs. That's been pretty common in the last five or six years since VMs have become more common. The problem is that you're spending a lot of extra resources on something you may not need. Um, if I want to isolate my DNS server, I can put it in CH3 jail, I can put it in the VM. Both will work just fine. If you put it on a full VM, now you've got an entire system of kernels, subsystems, and everything else that it wants to do, and that's going to be taking resources away from everything else that's on the system. So, now if you have a full VM solution, there is nothing they can do to break out of it, conceivably. But, the cost comes with higher resources. When can I use them? When should I use them? The most common reason for using a CH3 jail is for security reasons. Um, canonically, the domain name server it had some issues with it, so people, it was very easy to see through it. And so if you go look on the Linux documentation project, you'll see uh, documentation dated back to 2002, 2003 on how to see it through it. Because it had some issues. The same thing with SendMail. SendMail has a terrible track record. So people were saying, we've got to figure out some way that the next time SendMail gets compromised, we can prevent it from hitting the rest of our system. You can control your own level of risk using this method. Because you're deciding what goes into the c jail. You're deciding what to jail and how to do it. You're deciding how the permissions should be set up. You have far, level control, far more control than normal when we're just installing a system in software. You're protecting the services in the system from each other. So what happens if you have a web server and database server, one of them gets compromised, 
Well, you don't want the other one to get compromised because first one was. That's, that's, that's pretty common in compromise. Let's say I, I break into a web application sometime. I'm going to try to escalate privileges and try to do everything I can to take over the entire system. Now that I've got this little window into the system. So using C3 jails, you can prevent that escalation from happening. It's a, it's a best practice system. We were talking earlier about when building packages, how you want to set aside this one individual C true so that your specific changes to your system don't leak over into your package. This actually happened to me one time. I was building software packages for a server and I had upgraded some package and it was not, uh, the upgrade was not present in the normal distribution. And so here I was happily compiling this tool. I went and uploaded the package to my server and it didn't work. What's going on? So I had to go, it took me about oh, an hour and a half to figure out, oh right, I forgot, I upgraded this tool, the server doesn't have it. So I made an assumption by building just on my system that these, all the things that are on my system will also be present in the server. And that's not always an accurate uh, assumption. So it's, it's a good practice. It's, it's the best practice system. If you need to build parallel environments, you can host lots of different tools, all in the same system, all with relative security and relative ease. And you don't have to worry about one leaking over into another because they literally have their own little world. So now let's get into some of the nitty gritty. How do I create them? How do I plan them? Well, the very first thing you can do, you need to understand exactly what a process needs and how it's structured. And you need to understand how it interacts with the rest of the system. So, I'm going to break away here and show you an example. Can you guys see this if I'm typing? Yeah. Okay, great. So, I need to make sure that my system is actually running. Someone remember this uh, figure in here? Remember 33.129? Okay, table number. Yeah, that's the one I'm looking for. There we go. Okay, so now we're in this. This is a uh, blank Ubuntu 12 install that I set up about 30 minutes before the presentation. No changes to it. So we're going to come, we're going to poke around, and we're going to pick a system here, and I'm going to show you some tools and concepts. So, first thing I want to show you is relatively simple. Let's just go look at, let's go look at this tool. <coughs> this is a very simple tool. You guys know what the thing does now. Um, if I wanted to build a C true jail such that the user could run this one tool, this would be relatively straightforward. There's no requirements. I mean, it's got one library that needs a two. And it would be very easy to set up an environment to do so. In contrast, let's look at something like uh, post -it. I thought I didn't, so let's check. I did as so, well, so. Let's see where it is. SM, okay. So here we're getting up to a higher number of libraries. Sorry for the line right there. Um, also, Postfix has required. Uh, Wired set of configuration files, and Postfix is going to need network access, and it's going to need some device file access. And so we need to understand every single file that this tool needs to do its job. What are mandatory, what are optional, 
where they are expected because when you compile a tool, odds are you're telling it a default place for your configuration files. And if you don't specify it as a command line option, let's see if Postfix will tell us. Nope. Um, I do this. All the possible configurations and all those items. If you don't specify, it makes an assumption that assumption is hard coded at compile time. Those are things, again, those are things you need to understand about the system. What are these things are hard coded? What are these things can be altered? If I'm moving them around, because you are building an entirely new environment, if I'm moving them around, how do I tell the program that I've changed the location of its configuration files? How do I tell the, the location of device files? All these things that it's expecting. So, you really have to know the tool. So we're going to start small in the second session. We're going to start very, very small and build our way up to something like You have to build the path in the environment for your CH reach out. So, and this can technically go anywhere. And we can get into semantic arguments over whether it's better to go with slash var or slash opt or, you know, we can argue the ins and outs of an extended file, file system hierarchy, all that stuff. It doesn't really matter where it goes. Whatever you like. I have CH-rooted users in their home directory. I have CH-rooted them in other directories. I have CH-rooted services in slash var and slash opt. And I've done it all. It doesn't really matter where. Now this part gets a little interesting. So you're going to copy the process in particular that you're CH-rooted. Let's go back to our close week example. You've established the path for CH root two. You now have to duplicate everything that you know, postfix would expect in a normal system. You have to duplicate that exact same thing into your CH root two. So in our example, if postfix is looking for slash dev slash zero, now you have to create the same device file in the exact identical spot inside the CH root two. So in this example here, slash path slash d slash jail is our jail. So every single item has to be duplicated, everything that's mandatory. This is where the first step comes into play. If you don't understand your processes, needs, and structure, and everything it needs, you won't be able to do the third step here. And it's actually somewhat of an iterative process. You'll go through it, you'll get all the parts you think. You think you've got everything. You go back and try it. Oh, this doesn't work. Let's go dig a little deeper. What is it missing? OK. So then you go back and pinball between step one and step three, step one and step three, until the thing actually works. And it can be very frustrating going back and forth until it actually works. It can take, oh, hours. Usually your first time you're doing something complicated. Oh, sorry, that's a little bit low down there. Now, the last step here is after you've understood everything about the process, you've got all the pieces in place, now you need to tell your startup script for the process. I'm making an assumption here that we're CH treating a service. Now you have to tell the startup script to CH root. This is actually relatively easy depending on your distribution. In Ubuntu, there's the um, start stop daemon tool, I think. There's an actual CH root option in there. So let's see that. Let's see if any of these are using it. I don't think I have any in here that are using it. There we go. Very, very easy. You just give this one option and start stopping, and bam, it takes care of everything for you. You're talking something like Slack code where you have to do everything by yourself. Now you have to go set it up. You have to actually run the commands. You have to do the CH root to this location, and then So you have to understand your startup script for the service. You have to understand making sure you, you've got all the pieces you need for your CH root and alter your startup script to accommodate for it. Now sometimes that's easy, sometimes that's not. Let's, for example, look at the startup script for Postfix. I don't know why I'm picking on this so much. Uh, let's just go through and look at all the pathing and all the different things that's required. Oh look. There's the default file, it's doing lots and lots of extraneous stuff. It is expecting PID files in the var run directory, so you have to update that. 
It's expecting queue files in certain places. Look at this, it's, it's checking for queue directories right here in the middle. All this stuff is going to have to be altered in your CHR jail. So again, this goes back to understanding your tool. Yes. So, and actually, I don't tend to mount proc inside my CH roots, so that can be problematic. I would have to find another way to accomplish what that was, or decide I don't really need that function. Take it out. Again, that, that involves now we're getting into the territory. Now you have to be able to read this bash script, understand exactly what it's doing, why it's doing it, what parts can go, what parts can step. This is why CH review can get very difficult. Because altering all these things here, you have to be perfect about it. All the paths, you can just go through the graphic chain on the paths. And then you would end up crying yourself to sleep at night because you can't figure out why it's not working. Because there's so many things in here that it will miss. You have to basically rewrite this entire file. Let's just look further down here. So all these uh, calls here, post conf, post multi, every single one of those you're going to have to set up so it's calling the binary inside the CHR. Oh, I forgot to mention, post fix by itself doesn't do a whole lot. Post fix has a ton of little sub-binaries it calls. All those have to be in the CHR jokes. All the requirements of those tools have to be kept. So this is all snowballs. So step four can be as hard as steps one through three. I have run into that situation before. And you've been working on this thing all day, and you're to the point now where it works kind of, and you just want to start the script up and go home. And you spend another two hours tearing your hair out because your startup script isn't working. Right. That happens. It's unfortunate. It's what you're accepting when you go into the side of the future, too. Um, that's, that's just the way it is. So now let's go through some concepts to help you understand a little better what all is required in the business. Resource sharing. So let's compare c -truth jails to something like a virtual machine. With c -truth jail, you're still using the same resources on the system, the same process IDs, the same kernel, the same everything. What you're not sharing are the files. So the networking stack is shared on the system. You can communicate with the kernel just the way normal programs can. All that is shared. The file system is not. So inside the CH root jail, whatever, whatever you've put in there, that's all you'll we'll see. Programs that are outside of the CH root jail can have permissions to look in. In fact, that's one of the uh, easy ways to manage this whole configuration issue. We'll look at that in a second session. Um, so you have to understand some resources are shared, some are not. If you have a process in your CH room that needs to communicate with another tool, let's say, for example, PHP needs to communicate with MySQL, that's a pretty common one. I want to CH root the PHP process because my programmer really doesn't do a very good job of making things secure. I want to make sure that when his code screws up, it doesn't screw up the system. This has happened. Well, the traditional way that you would communicate with uh, MySQL is through a socket if you're talking about the same system. If you're doing it that way, the MySQL socket has to be inside the CH root jail. The MySQL binaries will make an assumption of where it is, so you have to make a judgment call here. Do I want to try and recompile MySQL? Do I want to just tell the binaries every time that the socket's over here in this location? Uh, you can skip all that though, because you can also contact MySQL through a network TCP socket. That's far easier. So if you need to share resources, Inside and outside of the jail, nine times out of ten, you're going to use networking of some kind. It's the easiest way to get information in and out of the jail. You can use sockets. I've done it before. It's a little annoying. I want to say sockets, I'm going to use sockets, just to be clear. Understanding stagnant compiled binaries versus dynamically linked binaries. When we're CH root jailing the process, we need to know, as I was showing you earlier with that tool, you have to know every single library that the binary needs to do its job. And every single one of those libraries needs to go inside the CH root. So when you study the compiled binary, you're basically saying, put all the contents of those libraries that I need into the binary itself. Uh, just to clarify, when I say the, the word binary, do you guys want to mean the actual executable itself? Just to be clear, okay, good. Um, static and compiled binaries are not common. 
you can set them up to be that way if you're deciding to compile them yourself. It saves you a lot of effort when building a CH with jail, but odds are now you're maintaining two different sets of tools. So you are still end up losing. If you use dynamically linked tools, then you can literally just copy and cherry pick items out of your system. But now you're having to maintain a fleet of libraries. So it's pick your poison here, which would you like? I normally go for the second. I prefer to just cherry pick out of the environment because that means when I do a system update and the library is updated, then I can pull that update into my system and I have to recompile. That's just my personal choice. You may choose to stay with compile. Permissions, users, and groups. This is a big old can of worms. And there's no way to get around it when we're talking features. Um, we'll see an example of this in the second session. Um, SSH is very picky about its users, groups, and permissions. And so when we're building the CH root jail for a user, we're going to be very careful about this. You can spend a very long time building a very well built, secure CH root jail, and all of it goes out the window because you have your permission set. If the goal is to hide information from the user, then set your permissions up. Make sure your users and groups are set up right. If the goal is to allow multiple users, and this is a situation I ran into, we see each rooted the web server and the site files for a particular site. The users that wanted to work with the site still need to interact with the site files and be updating, downloading the content, uh, writing to it. So then we had to set it up such that there was a group inside the CH root jail that matched the group that was outside the CH root jail, and everybody was happy because they all talked together. This can get really complicated. Um, I could probably spend 30 minutes going through examples on that, and we're not going to have time for it. This is one of those things that you'll want to look at later. File handle. This is an important concept for a specific subclass of uh, CH root. When you have a tool that understands that is being seen true. Some tools will actually give you the options to do so. Again, we'll look at that in the second session. Uh, there's an important concept here. When I start a program up, I need to open a file to read the contents of it. I need to open a file so I have somewhere to direct my log content when something breaks and I don't try not to. If this program that I'm writing or that I'm working with is seen true aware and it's well built, it will actually open all those file handles up early on in this process and leave them open and then we'll see your root into the place where it's supposed to go. Because those files are already open in file handles in the program, they don't need to be in the jail. So if you're writing a tool that you expect to be jailed and you're trying to figure out how to make it easy for the user to go with this, open up your file handles ahead of time. Open them up early in the process. So you can do some really cool stuff with this. Um, Postfix has a built-in way to see it root. In fact, some of its uh, binaries do it naturally. Uh, a lot of tools, uh, PHP FPM has a way to do it. And this is what it does, is it opens all the file handles it needs early on in its process, all the sockets that are expected to be there. It opens them all up, and then it slides down to the jail. So you don't need to have any of them in there. That saves a lot of time. But it only works if you're using a program that understands it's being seen root. Some will, some will. We'll look at examples of both. Interacting with other parts of the system. We did discuss this somewhat with the uh, TCP sockets versus your sockets. Uh, just the general rule is if whatever your CH root needs to talk outside of its CH root, it's going to have to use a network. So if you're writing a tool, expect there to be some networking. Just factor that into your equation for your program, how much you're going to have to take to do all this. So let's look at some of the tools we're going to use to build CHRs. I was just briefly showing you the LDD tool. Uh, it displays all the libraries that the binaries people was expecting to see. Now, if you believe this and you believe it is canon law, whatever LDD displays is it, you're going to have a bad time. Because there are situations where something is not linked explicitly against the binary, and you're not going to be able to see those things. We'll see an example of that in the second session where LD conveniently forgets to list some information that prevents a binary from working. So let's go look at uh, go look at some output from LDD. Oops, I'm 
Which one was it? Just a dead thing. Oh, I am? Another problem? Yeah. You're driving. Okay, good. Switch. <laughs> You're killing me, Smalls! Okay, well, at least it's a little easier to see there's less minutiae around the edge. Okay, we're, we're not going to... We'll, we'll just roll with this. Now, that's the way it is. Alright, so... So we were looking at this tool earlier. LED is showing me all the libraries that the pain binary is expected. Let's look at one that's a little more interesting. How about Bash? That's a common tool for CH reading if you're building user home environments. That's not so bad. How about. Now, I'm not going to go into exactly what all these different binaries are. That is a long rabbit trail. You can do that research on your own. If you really must know what libtinfo or SO.5 is. I will, however, discuss. Something that's important for building CH when it comes to libraries. The major and minor version number of a library. Let's pick on this libt info library here. Uh, the dot so extension indicates it's a shared object, otherwise a library, and then it can have one or more numbers afterwards. Let's go look at that. So what we're seeing here, in order to simplify things, a library can have major, minor, and I think point release numbers. And it can go even deeper than that. I've seen some I don't know how to do that. But for simplicity's sake, there are these symbols here. So we have the actual library actually named SO.5.9. That's its major and minor version number. Well, version 5.9 and version 5.8 version 5.7 should all have the same exact functionality. The only differences are that 8 or 9 are bug fix releases on top of 7. So, what we really only care about is the fact that it's major version 5. So they have added a sim link here, so if something is looking for, I need major version 5 of this library, they've got the sim link here to support it. And when you're building your CH roots and you're copying in libraries, be careful that you don't be copying in a bunch of empty sim links that go nowhere. So, just for example, Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to pretend like I'm building a seizure. So this library is resident and this slash lib slash n sixty six sixty four Linux. I don't feel like typing it all. There we go. That's where it lives. So I've created inside this bar slash bar slash C true directory. I'm starting to build my C true. I want to copy that library. Okay, so let's go copy the tinfo dot so five. Copy to you. Great, it worked. Actually it did work. Why did that work? Is it automatically for giving me the dash H one? I was totally gonna show you guys that. Anyway, the, what was supposed to happen in this example, it was only supposed to copy the symbol. Uh, I've actually had this problem before. 
It was very late at night. I was working on all these things. And I was like, why are my library's present? Oh, I copied this thing. So maybe this is a bunch of things. I don't know. Yeah, it was CP by default all Are you sure about that? Yes. I was building one 1004 and it was not doing that. Has it always done that? Yes. Did I have a cracked system or something? Okay. Well, that's great. Just make sure when you're copying these libraries in, you're not copying just in links. Um, make sure you're actually copying the file itself. So, no, well, there goes that again. Okay, now how do I get out of this thing? Left command. Left command. Did not work. Right. Well, we're trapped in here. Let's keep going on tour. <laughs> That's working so well. Please <laughs> get me out! We have jailed ourselves in the VM. This is wonderful. Left. Oh, hey, look at that! Very smart. Okay, so let's go back to where that was before. What was the next point we were going to go on to? S Trace, right. Um, S Trace is a very powerful, very wordy tool. When you cannot figure out why something is not working, you go to S-Trace. And I have sworn this very sentence without the belief because the real word, the sharp point word. Many a time when working with these things, and S-Trace is the thing that helps me figure out what's going on. So let's dive in on an example, because I love examples. How are we doing all the things I just did? Here we go. Let's figure out how S trace works. There's two major ways you use S trace. One of them, one of them is to see what a existing program is doing right now. So I apparently have a SSH session still running here. This is inside my VM, by the way. I want to see what the SSHD binary is doing. Let's go S trace that. Right now it's doing nothing. It's fascinating. Right. It's but let's do something a little more. Oh, there's stuff coming in. What is it doing? Whoopsie, we have to check that out. I've got to know what whoopsie is doing. Nothing. The whole or nothing going on in the system. Let's do this. Let's um let's set up a trial example. I'm going to do five. Okay, so here I've got this nice pretty little script doing something. Go over here. By the way, I'm using a tool screen. If you come to my session on Sunday, you'll learn all about it. It's really powerful. Let's go look at it. One of these three. Let's guess which one it is. Um, ice pen. Ice pen. Nope, that ain't it. Eighteen thirty-three. There we go. So now we're seeing this is live. So the system calls that that little script that I wrote is doing. You can see here it's. I'm going to try and follow it. All right, so it's waiting for a little while. Then it's writing to. You know, when you get into system calls, now you're getting into really deep territory. If you want to know exactly what the write command is doing, you go to the man page. I'll just give you a quick overview. Right, the first argument here is the file handle that it's writing to. Second argument is what is it writing to? And the third is something that I don't care about. I don't know. This uh, returns a value of how much data was being written. So here we're seeing it's writing 47 with an inline to file handle 1, which is standard out. And it's doing some stuff I don't care about. I don't know why it's piping. It's doing a whole lot of stuff I don't care about. Why is it doing a lot? I don't know. That's just sleep call. Okay. Sleep is apparently doing a lot more than just sleep. So when you're using S trace, I said it's very wordy, you're going to have far more information than you actually need. It's 
It's going to be a tool or a task to filter out and find out what's actually at. So here, a whole bunch of extra stuff, RT underscore city property I don't know what that does. There you go look it up. It's not necessary for me to do my task. I'm looking for certain key things. I'm looking for read syscalls, write syscalls, opens, stats. Uh, let's see here. Let's see if I can get a better example of something. Surely it does kind of do something. Let's look at it. I don't remember 11 to 9. What is it? There's a whole lot of waiting on. If I had services on here and actual things are working, like actual tasks where I'm going, like if you've got a web server, just try this tracing your web server process one time and see what's going on. It's pretty fascinating. You get a, a good idea of the inner working stuff. So that's one way to use S trace. Another way is to start a tool inside. So let's do something like this. Ping 127.2.0. Very terribly useful. But it's telling us all the system calls that Ping is making until I control C. Part of the problem here is S trace is coming to standard error. I don't know if you guys are familiar with console very much. Standard out, standard error are two different uh, output file handles, I guess is a good way to put it. So ping in a normal sense is doing this. It's bringing a very small amount of information. It's bringing all this information to standard out. Meanwhile, if I run ping inside of S trace, all this extra information here is being printed to standard error. So it's really, the screen is too small, it's flying by too fast, we're going to have some good way to capture the data. So let's do this. One, again, that's the same as a command. I'm now going to dump the contents of what S trace is printing out to a file. Now the tool is operating like normal. In the background, my S trace data is being captured to this file that I was clicked. Now I can go at my leisure review all the things that P is doing. So it starts at the very top, the exec D says we're starting a new program, and here's the program itself, and then the parameters that it was called with. You know, if you've done programming, these are basically, you know, these are the parameters of the past two main call. All the things it's doing here. So at the very top, we see this ld.so.nohwcap. A lot of these up front here are looking for proper libraries. When we looked at ping, it only had two libraries. But part of the process of a program starting up is finding those libraries. And that goes really deep into operating system theory. I really don't want to go into that. That's something I'm hoping you guys will study on your own. How all that works. It's fascinating. But there's so much to cover, we can't cover it here. So when we're looking at the contents of this S trace, it's looking for the sliders. Let's look for T info, I think. Okay, that's not it. Lipc got us what it says. Let's look at it. Okay, here we go. So here we see it open, open this particular library with some certain flag on it. And then the very next thing it's doing is reading from it because it's got some information it needs. Uh, then it's memory mapping some portions of the file that's just opened into memory so we can use it later. It's protecting that section of RAM. Let's see, can we go on more and more and more of that stuff? Okay, here we go. Now we're getting down into socket calls and um, actual networking stuff. There's just a lot of fascinating information. There's a lot of useless information in here, too. But it's a lot of fascinating information. And you can ask trace any tool you want in your system. Um, as you're building your CH roots, it can be kind of useful to put S S trace inside your CH root. Sometimes you just cannot figure out for the life of you why this thing is not working. Then you can S trace inside the CH root jib. You 
can ask Trace outside, and you can compare the two and see where do they differ. And that will give you a good clue what am I missing. A lot of this is detecting. And these two tools are the main tools you're using to do your work. So, what was it? Uh, command F to get out of that? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so this is the end of the first session. How are we doing on time? A little bit earlier. You guys have uh, questions, things I didn't cover adequately? You have a. Uh, yes, in the back. I'm pretty familiar with SC Linux, at least for the services. Is TrueRoot even relevant or needed when you have SC Linux running? So the question is Is C or TrueRoot relevant when SC Linux is running? I would say so. Um, it's duplicating work at that point. And you're building. Which is easier, building a C2 jail or building a new SC Linux context for a tool? Um, actually, for most of my stuff, the standard context does everything I need it to do. Okay. So I don't have to modify the context, I'm just going to make sure SC Linux is enabled. Okay. So then the equivalent for that would be like App Armor on Ubuntu, something like that. Why go to all this stuff? That's a very good question. Um, I honestly have not dove into as Linux very much for App Armor. It's been one of my list of things to do for a long time. Uh, my extended experience with SC Linux is set permissive mode off. That's it. Probably you guys have a lot of the same experience. Um, I would like to change that, but it hasn't happened yet. And when I do learn about it, maybe I'll find out now. I'm going through all this trouble for nothing. I mean, it, it looks really cool for like giving a user the ability to do pain and other stuff. From a services point of view, it seems like a lot of work compared to SMLX. It is a lot of work. Um, that's, I'd like to talk with you more about that later. I mean, you can help me figure out why I need to prioritize SMLX above other things in my learning. Okay, so other questions? Comments? Yes? How do these differ from jails and BSD? That is also a good question. I don't really understand BSD very well. Do you, do you understand BSD, Jones? No, I don't. That's okay. what I was asking. Well, uh, I don't know, but we can look together. Would you guys mind if I went out to Google and answer this one? All right, let's do it. Because I'm curious too. I have very little experience with Jones. I think it's almost more like container. Okay, so I think, yeah, that sounds familiar. So BSD Jail would be equivalent to a Linux container. It's more than just C tree. So you see a truth as I'm discussing is literally just the files. Everything is still shared, the kernel is still shared, the context is still shared. Technically, a program that is CH rooted can still reach into RAM and make kernel calls and all that. That is shared by the rest of the system. So technically, a CH root program can still exert some influence on the system. And BSD jails, I believe that that's kind of completely separate. I believe. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, you can actually like, uh, use there a resource for that container? <laughs> no, they're too simple for that. Okay. So, yeah. So you can get in a situation where you see a true tool and someone has managed to get into it and they're using all of your resources, and you're still going to have that problem. So that's one of those you have to decide. You have to make a choice up front. Is it worth it for me to go to a full VM or an open V0 or LFC container? Um, so you can protect yourself from that too. That's a very good question. And it's one of those decisions when you're planning up front. Again, you have to know it's possible. So part of that's what this is for. What is possible? And once you know what's possible, you have to decide what is my level of risk? What am I willing to uh, take? What, what do I think are my most likely scenarios for attack? And for the protected kiss? So, very good question. Any other questions? I try not to. Uh, and assist the I do sometimes. But, uh, I did a lot of packaging for software back in the day. I, uh, for a long time, refused to keep a compiler on my source. And uh, so that necessitates building packages somewhere else and then go to the end. So I, that's where I kind of lost my taste for it entirely. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so we're done just a little bit early. I'm going to break and get some water. You guys get up and walk around. Uh, come back here in 10, 15 minutes and we'll get started with the second session where we're going to be diving in very heavy into the end. Yeah, it's...
Thank you guys for coming. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication. From Wicked. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature-rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. 
And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources, and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people. Uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is a key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that 
Um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. <laughs>